asked to say a few words about why this topic is dear to our heart here at the British Library. Christopher's wonderful new book tells the stories of people from the past who were passionate about manuscripts, including makers, patrons, collectors, dealers, librarians, and more. He imagines these people as part of a manuscripts club where membership requirement is simply an obsession with manuscripts. I think we might have a few likely members around here. Two of the club members to whom Christopher devotes chapters in our particular British Library heroes. Their dedication and sense of public spirit profoundly shaped the British Library's manuscript collections and brought countless historic treasures into national ownership. The first of these is Sir Robert Cotton, who was a politician and antiquary of the 16th to 17th centuries and a collector of a truly astonishing library. Cotton was able to acquire manuscripts um, that had been dispersed from the great monastic libraries of medieval England at the dissolution only as a generation or so earlier. Probably no collector at any time before or after has been able to amass a collection of such high significance. His collection includes treasures such as Magna Carta, the Cotton Genesis, the only surviving copies of Beowulf and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and probably the greatest achievement of early English book art, the Lindisfarne Gospels. I hope Christopher will excuse me if I take this moment to briefly plug my own book, The Lindisfarne Gospels, Art, History and Ins Inspiration. It's a beautiful and accessible guide to the history, contents and art of the Lindisfarne Gospels, published last September to coincide with the loan of the Lindisfarne Gospels to a dedicated exhibition at the Lang Art Gallery in Newcastle. You can pick up a copy in all good bookshops, including the British Library Shop, both on site and online. But back to Robert Cotton. Cotton has always been noted for his willingness to make his collection available to other antiquarians and scholars. This legacy was secured when in 1701, his grandson, Sir John Cotton, bequeathed his library to the nation for public use and advantage. The Cotton Library became a founding collection of the British Museum in 1753, and the British Museum Library was transferred to the British Library upon its creation in 1973. In 2018, the Cotton Collection was added to the UNESCO Memory of the World UK Register as a key part of the intellectual heritage of the nation. Another of our great British Library heroes who features in Christopher's book is Sir Frederick Madden, keeper of manuscripts at the British Museum Library from 1837 to 1866. During his time at the library, Madden personally oversaw the acquisition of a phenomenal number of manuscripts for the collection. He had a huge network of contacts through which he was acquiring manuscripts literally every few days. He was also meticulous in his record keeping and we have an extensive archive of his correspondence and notes. Madam was also responsible for leading a painstaking project to conserve the cotton collection, which had been ravaged by a terrible fire in 1731. Using what were then pioneering techniques, he was able to stabilize many of the fire-damaged volumes and make them usable again. His solutions still hold good today, and many of co the cotton manuscripts are still preserved in the paper guards and bindings that Madden had individually crafted for them. As someone who works with the British Library's manuscript collections today, I feel like Frederick Madden is still a colleague, despite the fact that he has been dead for 150 years. We, can, we still consult Madden's notes and correspondence on a regular basis. His handwriting is a familiar sight, and he still sits in on all our meetings, since his portrait hangs in our departmental meeting room. The British Library wouldn't have such a world-class collection if it weren't for passionate members of the Manuscripts Club like Cotton, Madden and many others. After the talk, I encourage you to see some of the fruits of their labours in the Library's Treasures Gallery, where a selection of fantastic manuscripts are on display for free. But that's enough from me. Let's find out more from our guest for the evening, Christopher de Hamel. Christopher has been a reader in the manuscripts department here since 1972. 
He was responsible for all catalogues and sales of medieval manuscripts at Sotheby's for 25 years, and then for 17 years, he was a fellow librarian of Corpus Christi College in Cambridge in charge of the Parker Library. He has given Panizzi, Sanders, and Lyle lectures. His very numerous books, several published by the British Library, include Meetings with Remarkable Manuscripts in 2016, which won both the Duff Cooper Prize and the Wolfson History Prize. He is with us this evening to talk about his latest book, The Posthumous Papers of the Manuscripts Club. Please could you all welcome Christopher de Hamel. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when one of the most beautiful sights in the world is the great glass tower of George III's books behind me, every one of which is closed, it seems almost discourteous to open the book I'm meant to be talking about. And so let's begin with its outside cover. You can tell immediately that the manuscripts referred to here must be medieval for the decorated border is taken from an early 16th century book of hours in what is known as the Ghent Bruges style of illumination, characteristic of the southern Netherlands, in which naturalistic flowers and fruit appear to be scattered across a yellow or gold background. Most of the plants shown here are easily identifiable after 500 years. Roses, pinks, strawberries and red currants, pansies and probably cranes bill in pale blue in the lower right-hand corner. The large peacock is also immediately recognisable. To keep it fairly local, compare this, uh, photographed in Holland Park. Peacocks were believed in the Middle Ages to have incorruptible flesh, and they became emblems in art for immortality, a good portent as we launch a new book, except that they can also symbolise pride one of the seven deadly sins here on the windowsill. Peacocks are actually quite common in medieval manuscripts. This is another example from a Ghent Bruges border in a British Library manuscript, among those presented by George III. The border of the book cover is actually taken from this page in a manuscript in the Morgan Library in New York. And you can see that the designer has reversed it to make it fit the jacket more appropriately. You will, of course, uh, immediately have recognised from the style of painting that the illuminator must be Simon Benning, whose self-portrait in old age is in the Victorian Albert Museum. Notice the position of the window behind his left shoulder. This is always recommended in medieval craftsmen's manuals because it means that the artist can work at his desk without the shadow of his hand falling across the page he's painting. When Simon Benning copies flowers, for example, the shadows are always, and without exception, on the right because his light source comes from the left. Therefore, you could tell at once that the cover image on the book is back to front because the shadows are on the wrong side. The manuscript itself is a book of hours, the standard late medieval prayer book for use by the laity. The full opening here comprises prayers to St. Roche, patron against the Black Death, from which he was himself cured by an angel, as shown in the picture, with help from a dog. He's sometimes invoked today as the patron saint for COVID, and he certainly is of dogs. Just so that you don't feel left out, here is a British Library manuscript of the same subject. Same artist, no peacock. At the front of the manuscript in New York is the coat of arms of the Portuguese family of da Costa, and the volume is known as the da Costa Hours. That name would have had a special resonance for Belle da Costa Green, Pierpont Morgan's dapper and flirtatious librarian, who purchased this manuscript on her own initiative from a widow in Philadelphia for $10,000 in January 1910. She was of quite dark complexion, 
which she explained by aristocratic descent through her widowed mother from the de Costas of Portugal. She was at this moment just beginning a love affair with the celebrity art historian Bernard Berenson, and her European ancestry was important to her international persona. I've been to read her love letters to Berenson at the Villa Itati just outside Florence, and they sizzle with passion and desire and a frankness and use of exclamation marks which we mere medievalists seldom encounter in our archival researches. <laughs> Let's come back to the title, The Posthumous Papers of the Manuscripts Club. The wording is based on the original and correct title of the Pickwick Papers, as shown on the right here, with its own kind of illuminated border. In the edition of, book, of the book for America, where apparently they've never heard of Dickens, uh, it will simply be called the Manuscripts Club. Of course, in reality, no such club exists. We all know what it's like to go to a conference or a meeting of a society on a specialised subject. This might be, in my case, some association devoted to illuminated manuscripts, but it could be on almost any subject steam engines or bird watching or postage stamps, football, Jane Austen, music, anything. And you're all there together because you have a particular obsession or hobby in common. This shared passion overrides all inequalities of age or background. You find yourself in the most unlikely of settings talking to people far beyond your own domestic circle. This is actually photographed in the British Library Auditorium. The 18-year-old boy from Texas can sit down at breakfast with a retired mayor of Sarajevo and a clergyman from Glasgow, for example, and in this context, they converse as absolute equals. These are people who would never have known one another without the topic which brings them into uninhibited fellowship. Differences of social upbringing or wealth are irrelevant. Within the club, a shared enthusiasm crosses all boundaries. The idea of the new book, then, is to take this conviviality not across the world, as in an actual club, but backwards through a thousand years of history. We choose 12 diverse people obsessed with illuminated manuscripts for a dozen very different reasons and we go back together to meet them and to talk animatedly about manuscripts. There is St Anselm in the 11th century, Benedictine monk, the Duke de Berry, brother of the King of France, patron and medieval prince, the bookseller in 15th century Florence, Vespasiano de Bisticci, shown here from a British Library manuscript, Simon Benning, illuminator of the De Costa Hours, to whom we've already been introduced. The watchful Jacobean antiquary, Sir Robert Cotton, photographed from his marble bust on the wall, just beyond the staircase on my right, just over there. The Jewish chief rabbi, David Oppenheim of Moravia and Bohemia. The quarrelsome and learned priest from Avignon, Jean-Joseph Reeve, possibly also a thief. Sir Frederick Madden of the British Museum, now British Library, keeper of manuscripts. The mysterious forger of Greek manuscripts, Constantine Simonides. The German editor of classical texts, Theodore Mommsen, the only paleographer ever to win the Nobel Prize. Sir Sidney Cockerell, museum director, connoisseur and private collector. And finally, the astonishing Belle de Costa Green herself, curator to the richest man in America and probably the only manuscript librarian ever to have had her portrait painted with no clothes on, <laughs> by Matisse, no less. These 12 figures, then, are the founding members of my manuscripts club. Every one of them, for a very different reason, is utterly occupied with a life among illuminated manuscripts. I imagine going to see each one of them in turn and experiencing and sharing our common delight in the enjoyment of manuscripts as one might at the breakfast table or on the bus during a conference. Of course, this is not fiction. 
Time travel in reality is not possible except through the study of history. I've not invented any conversations, but I do try to describe what it would probably have been like to meet each one of these people in their lifetimes and how this might have come about and where it could have taken place. In most cases, I've actually been to where they once lived, calling at castles and synagogues and libraries which they once inhabited. The experience was made more intense by the sudden opening and closing of borders during successive waves of COVID lockdown. I've driven from the Channel Tunnel down to Beck Abbey in Normandy, for example, where Anselm was a monk from 1060 until 1093. And I've sat in the cloister on the site where he would have received his guests and where the library of the monastery would have been kept. And I've looked at every surviving manuscript from his time in Paris and elsewhere. And it can bring us very close to Anselm to be able to touch and smell and turn the pages of books which he probably handled daily. I've twice eaten in the modern pizzeria, now occupying the exact site of where Vespasiano de Bisticci had his shop in the Via del Proconsolo in Florence. In the room where he once chatted to Poggio and to Cosimo de Medici and to Pope Nicholas V, all irrepressible members of the Manuscripts Club. It was probably right here that Montefeltro, Duke of Urbino, told Vespasiano that he would never admit a printed book into his library. I've stood to at the tomb of Rabbi Oppenheim in the Jewish cemetery in Prague, a great chaos of tumbling stones in Hebrew, and at that of Sir Robert Cotton in Connington Church near Peterborough. Here I am, gazing directly into the eyes of the man who owned Beowulf and the Lindisfarne Gospels, now made even more famous, if that's possible, by our chairman tonight. I love manuscripts. I love seeing them and talking about them and being shown them. I enjoy meeting fellow enthusiasts. I want to know everything about manuscripts, where they were made and when and why and who wrote them and how long it took and what they were copied from and what decoration they have and how they were used and read and bound and stored and where they've been ever since. I want to know who's owned them and where they were found and what they cost and how they fitted a collection or didn't and how they had them kept and shelved, and what it was which caught their owner's imagination, not just once, but through each generation since the manuscripts were new. I would love to talk to every member of my manuscripts club, and let's try to do so with one or two. Here is the Duke de Berry at a New Year's feast, probably in 1413. It's from the opening from, of one of the most famous illuminated manuscripts in the world, the so-called Très Riche Heur of the Duke himself. New Year's Day was the occasion of giving and receiving luxury gifts known as Etren, and the acquisitive Duke here is welcoming his guests with the gold words above, approche, approche. In reality, I think it would have been very difficult to approach the Duke de Berry. He was a prince of a royal family who were more or less absolute monarchs. He was autocratic, imperious, and tyrannical. Apart from manuscripts, he perhaps had one weakness. Notice the little dogs up on the table at the lower right, just in front of the duke. Similar dogs, they may be French whippets, also occur at the duke's feet in many of his portraits. One of these lap dogs in reality was called Lion, perhaps this one. Like St. Roche, the Duke clearly loved dogs. At one time he had up to 1,500 hounds, mostly for hunting, shown here too in the Très Rigeur. Imagine the noise. The Duke may have been autocratic and unapproachable, but it's an old chat-up technique that if you want to strike up a conversation with a stranger, admire their dog. We would begin talking and then I would mention manuscripts. From that moment, everything would change. 
The Duke's illuminated manuscripts were mostly kept at the Chateau de Mont-sur-Yèvre, which is now about a 20-minute drive northwest of Bourges. The castle itself, shown in this scene of the Temptation of Christ in the Très Régeur. These days, you park your car at the entrance to the municipal gardens on the right, uh, beyond where the lion is standing. You cross the stream over a little wooden bridge about where the boat is shown, and you scramble up the bank to the castle, and this is what you find. To put them side by side, you get this. The central tower is mostly intact, at least up to the first row of crenellations, as are parts of the tower on the right, and it's imaginable that the library was in the space between them. The Duke owned about 300 manuscripts, of which about a quarter still survive. Several of them now in the very building where we are meeting tonight. From his detailed and successive inventories, we can build a vivid idea of the Duke's taste and delight in manuscripts. I know we would both enjoy ourselves as we pulled volumes from the shelves, exclaiming our delight. Apart from his fascination in new and innovative compositions, he clearly also liked books of strange formats and size. He commissioned the biggest book of hours then ever made. But he also owned a tiny gospel of St. John, which the inventory describes as being the size of un blanc, which was a tiny silver-based coin under an inch high, like this, from the reign of Charles VI. And so the manuscript was about this size, an unnoticed and astoundingly early reference to a kind of book made now exclusively for bibliophilic delight. I don't know how this slide works, but I love the way the pages flutter. <laughs> I can imagine the Duke entranced by such an oddity. Many of you will have seen the Anglo-Saxon exhibition here in the British Library in 2018, including this manuscript lent from Paris, an extraordinarily shaped 11th century Canterbury Psalter, nearly 21 inches high by only seven wide. Nowhere in the cap caption or catalogue did it record that the manuscript had belonged to the Duke de Berry. In fact, his oldest manuscript. For he bought antiquarian manuscripts as well as modern ones. Manuscripts have a way of surviving. You're all bookish people, I assume, or you wouldn't be on the British Library's mailing list. We all know how difficult it is to throw away a book, even if it was not necessarily expensive. Most of us still own very few possessions from our childhoods, but the chances are that these will include at least some books, still preserved when the tricycles and cricket bats have long been discarded. Books get put back on the shelves and left alone. The Duke de Berry would have been astonished that his massive and apparently indestructible castles of solid stone are now mostly ruins or destroyed entirely, whereas hundreds of his delicate little fragile manuscripts still survive safely into our times. Manuscripts are surprisingly robust, but one thing they do not like is fire. This would undoubtedly have been one of the topics of conversation if the different members of my manuscript club could actually have met in, uh, in reality. Here is one of the British Library copies of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which belonged to Sir Robert Cotton, subject of Chapter 5. I've marked with a little yellow arrow the reference to the fire in Canterbury Cathedral at Easter 1066 which destroyed most of the Anglo-Saxon library there. When the Norman conquerors appointed Lanfranc, archbishop in 1070, he found that the cathedral had lost many essential books and he wrote for help to his former colleague Anselm at Beck, back in Normandy. Here are the two of them. The correspondence on replacing the burnt books of Canterbury is an important part of chapter one. 
and we can watch them sourcing and interviewing scribes, borrowing and lending exemplars, checking texts, and sending them eventually off to England. We learn of one of Anselm's manuscripts being carried in the saddle bag of a servant of the Bishop of Rochester as he was riding his horse across London Bridge when they suddenly fell through a hole in the bridge and tumbled into the Thames. Hard to imagine now. However, all was well, for the horse swam ashore and the manuscript was recovered safely. It may well have been this manuscript, which, as you can see from the signature in the lower margin, later also belonged to Sir Robert Cotton. I don't need to tell this audience what an important part fire came to have in the history of the Cotton Library. You will all know that about a hundred years after the collector's death, the manuscripts were being stored in the projecting wing with two upright windows, whoops, upright windows in the centre here, in a building which is now part of Westminster School. You can see the central crossing and the south transept of Westminster Abbey behind. In the early hours of one night in October 1731, a chimney caught fire and the upstairs library burst into flames. Volunteers threw manuscripts out of the windows into the schoolyard below. When the fire was finally extinguished, some manuscripts were found to have been totally destroyed, such as Asser's Life of King Alfred and the unique manuscript of the Anglo-Saxon poem on the Battle of Malden. Other books were reduced to charred and water-stained fragments. Little shrunken pieces like this are all that survive from the sensational illuminated manuscript of Genesis of the 6th century, no less. It had been included in the portrait of Cotton, painted in 1626, in which the collector was rather shockingly placing his hand proprietorily directly on the ancient illumination. One result of the cotton fire was not all bad, for it focused the minds of Hanoverian England on the vulnerability of our national history and literature, leading by way of several other circumstances to the creation of the new British Museum in the old Montague House in 1753, into which the remains of the cotton manuscripts were transferred in 1757, the direct ancestor of the British Library today. And that is why his portrait is, or his bust, is on my right. It's important for us book people to remember that the British Museum was founded primarily as a library, which is what museum means in Greek. The head of the institution, called the director then now, was then known as the principal librarian. There were initially only three departments. These were manuscripts, printed books, and what was quaintly called natural and, and artificial productions, which was everything else. These included stuffed animals, minerals and shells, and a few miscellaneous antiquities. As you will know, the natural history specimens were moved out to South Kensington in 1881. And the books were brought up here to their new brick ziggurat in 1997. At the time, many of us wished that the library could have stayed in the museum building and that those tedious artificial productions might have been moved out instead. I don't know what you did during COVID lockdown, but I read the unpublished journals of Sir Frederick Madden, conveniently, if unromantically, from the microfilms made by the Bodleian Library in 1973. Madden is the subject of my chapter eight. The diaries run from 1819, when Madden was 18, and still with his parents in Portsmouth, where he came from a naval family, until 1872, 54 years later, six years after retirement and disillusioned by the modern world and his disappointing children. The volumes are simply 
enormous. And he generally wrote many pages a day in which he confides and rants and documents in meticulous detail his daily life and anxieties, love affairs, and medieval manuscripts. Almost 18,000 closely written pages in handwriting, not always easy to read. Various campaigns to publish the Madden Diaries have been stalled by the overwhelming immensity of the task. Madden first came to the British Museum Library in 1823. He has his earliest reader's ticket, not so different from those in use today. In 1824, he was interviewed for his first job, and he made a little sketch of it. That's Madden on the left, age 24, and Henry Ellis in the middle, then Keeper of Manuscripts, a hitherto unpublished moment in British Library history. Madden's professional world came to be dominated by his notorious and implacable hatred of his closest museum colleague, Antonio Panizzi, innovator of the circular reading room. Sometimes you can practically see the smoke issuing from the journals. Here is Frederick Madden, keeper of manuscripts, high Tory, formal, well-dressed, first-class paleographer, snobbish, insecure, easily offended, and staggeringly uncooperative. This is Panizzi, keeper of printed books, liberal, scruffy, overweight, slippery, charming, Catholic, and regarded by Madden as worst of all, foreign. Both of them were intellectual giants and geniuses of the highest order. On eventually becoming keeper of manuscripts in 1837, Madden acquired the key to the upstairs charter room, as it was called, where the unsorted residue of the burnt manuscripts from the cotton fire were then kept. It probably looked something like this. His obsession with salvaging and re reconstructing the cotton fragments occupied much of his career and was regarded by him as no less important than his lifetime achievements in acquisition. This is from a culturally from Worcester. And this is the unique manuscript of Beowulf, the greatest text of Old English literature. There was a dreadfully near repetition of disaster in 1865 at 9 p.m. on Monday the 10th of July, the Maddens were at home when their manservant rushed in to say that the British Museum was on fire in the bindery, it turned out, where the cotton manuscripts were being uh, restored. The horse-drawn fire brigade was summoned by telegram. I longed to know how that worked. And two fire engines arrived within half an hour. The fire was put out by 10.15, but not before several more manuscripts had been destroyed. In a way that seems extraordinary today, a huge amount of staff time was then spent on acquisitions. Nearly every day, people came in with manuscripts they hoped to sell. Many were bought for the museum on the spot, often for quite small sums. As keeper of manuscripts, Madden acquired more than 30,000 manuscripts for the National Collection. That's an average of about three a day. He went to view countless manuscripts in auctions across London, often several times a week, and the diaries are filled with worries and strategies and sleepless nights as the sale dates approached. He had successes and disasters, and like all collectors, he usually remembered his failures more than his triumphs. In the Heber sale in 1836, he bought this Lancelot for 131 pounds, five shillings. But for a similar sum, he lost the romance of Guy of Warwick, which he really wanted for the library. In the Stuart de Rothsay sale in 1855, he lost the miroir historial on which he'd set his heart. But as a result, he had money left over to buy the wonderful little book of hours written by San Vito and illuminated in the 1530s by Giulio Clovio for only 115 pounds 10 shillings and a much greater manuscript. When Madden reported this sensational acquisition to the trustees, 
Sir David Dundas, former Solicitor General, asked in all seriousness whether the naked putty in the borders should be painted over in order not to offend the more sensitive visitors to the museum. On a Saturday morning in 1842, this man came to see Madden. He was W.H. Hamilton, a museum trustee who had arranged the shipping of the Elgin marbles and the Rosetta Stone to England. He was a close friend of Panizzi, and Madden was surprised to find him friendly. Do you think he looks trustworthy? He produced these, a series of vast vellum pages about 23 inches high from an astonishing 16th century genealogy of the Royal House of Portugal, which he said were the property of a Spanish noble family. Here's a detail, like the most magnificent old master portraits of the time, and here's another. Madden wrote in his journal, in regard to the art displayed in these paintings, it was the most exquisite and finished I ever beheld. And such was the opinion of all who looked at them after myself. Hamilton persuaded Madden to rush through a purchase application to the meeting of the museum trustees that very afternoon for 600 pounds. And he ensured the committee accepted it. I confess I never had a greater treat, Madden wrote that night. Within three weeks, Madden had identified the artist as Simon Benning again, whom we'd already met. And he matched them up with a chronicle published in 1619, describing the commissioning of the leaves in 1530 from Simon of Bruges by the Prince of Portugal. A special wooden and glass display case was constructed, and all important visitors to the museum were shown them, including the King of Saxony and collectors such as James Denniston and Walter Sneed. From chance encounters as the months passed, Madden gradually learnt that he'd been stitched up by Hamilton, who was doubtless taking a private commission, and that the leaves did not at all come from a Spanish nobleman, but a Mr. Newton Scott, who'd brought them recently for a few pounds on an open-air stall in Madrid, and that the previous owner was the bookbinder to the King of Portugal, who, in Madden's opinion, had probably stolen them from the Royal Library in Lisbon. When Hamilton finally retired as a trustee in 1858, Madden wrote in his journal, a more prejudiced person never existed, nor a greater jobber when it related to himself and his friends. I hope never again to see his ugly face. Another provenance which might not pass scrutiny today was this. It's the famous Romanesque cartulary of Winchester Cathedral, or Codex Wintoniensis with many unique Anglo-Saxon texts. It's preserved in its original blind-stamped binding, one of the earliest English decorated book bindings in existence, with fly leaves from an unsealed manuscript of the 8th century. In January 1842, the historian J.G. Nichols happened to be in Winchester, and he reported seeing the manuscript laid out for sale among the effects of the late Canon Watkins, former cathedral librarian. And Madden immediately assumed that it, it had come by mistake from the cathedral. And he had it withdrawn from the auction and returned. Then came the surprise. The Dean of Winchester absolutely denied that it was ever their property. Two years later, a recruit to the new Department of Coins and Medals mentioned that his father was a canon of Winchester. Madden seized the chance and wrote to him at once, offering to buy the unwelcome manuscript. On receipt, the dean and chapter suddenly remembered that it was indeed their property, and they agreed to sell it for £200. Sometime later, Madden was chatting to a former solicitor from Winchester, and remarked that the manuscript probably didn't really belong to the cathedral anyway. The man said it did, but it was in the choir school where the smallest choristers used to sit on it like a cushion so they could see over the pews. Madden was involved too in the 
13th century Mappa Mundi from Hereford Cathedral. I have a personal connection here because for six months in 1989, it was in my own custody at Sotheby's while possible sale was considered. And the cathedral hired a conservator from Hampton Court to make sure it was properly kept. And I later married her. Anyway, in 1855, Madden borrowed it too in the hope of buying it for the museum. It was then in a medieval wooden frame. Madden sent it to the museum bindery to have it taken out and flattened. When it came back, he found they had removed it by cutting off the original border which surrounded the map and had been concealed under the frame. Madden was angry and appalled at this destruction and then decided to say nothing, hoping that the cathedral wouldn't notice when it was returned. And to the best of my knowledge, they never have. <laughs> Throughout all this time, Madden was quarrelling furiously with Panizzi. Both behave badly like spoilt children. He's a dirty, pitiful Italian blackguard, Madden wrote in his journal, and only his dirty friends, the Whigs, could have placed such a man in the museum. When Panizzi's great circular reading room was opened in 1857, Madden refused to attend. The principal staff then all lived on the premises. The Madden's four children were all born in the museum. This is the birth announcement of the eldest. I don't suppose many people are born in the British Library these days. The whole family was photographed in 1863. They also had a dog, Fido, whom Panizzi tried to get banned from the premises, citing an 18th century statute. This was won by Madden. And when Fido died of old age in 1864, he was buried under a lilac bush in the museum garden. There was also a cat called Mouton. We have a picture of him drawn by Madden's 10-year-old daughter, Emily, for use as a book plate. <laughs> Mouton was born in Paris and was given to Madden by the bookseller William Boone for Christmas 1854. In June 1855, Mouton went missing. Madden reported his loss to the police and had notices printed offering 20 shillings for his recovery. Two days later, he was found, locked in Panizzi's coal cellar. Not all manuscripts were secured for the library, or at least not initially. In 1842 and 1858, Madden examined the vast and glittering Sherburn Missal then owned by the Duke of Northumberland, and he valued it at the giddy sum of 600 pounds. It was finally acquired in 1998 by the British Library, as it had become by then, largely negotiated on behalf of the seller by me, for a reported 15 million. In 1862, Madden was shown the delicate St Cuthbert Gospel book, but declined to guess the age of what we now know to be an 8th century binding. In 2012, it too was bought by the nation for approximately 9 million. Both are on exhibition through there at the moment. An even greater missed opportunity was in 1856 when the Duke d'Aumal brought in a manuscript for identification recently found in Genoa, and he unwrapped onto Madden's desk the Très Riche Heure, of the Duke de Berry, perhaps the most valuable book in the world. Here is part of Madden's description of it. It is a most beautiful and interesting volume, and I covet it exceedingly for the museum, he wrote. However, Panizzi, who liked foreign dukes, later charmed the owner into bringing it to a tea party at Windsor Castle and showing it to Queen Victoria, and somehow Madden decided it wasn't so interesting after all. And it's now in the Musée Condé at Chantilly, north of Paris. Although most members of my imaginary manuscript club never knew one another in reality, the same manuscripts often wind through the story. The Très Richeur was, of course, known to the Duke de Berry in Chapter 2, and to Simon Benning in Chapter 4, who examined it in Mechlin, 
and to Madden, as we've just seen, and to Sidney Cockerell of Chapter 11, who in 1906 took Bernard Shaw to see it in Chantilly, where I too have handled it twice. The subjects of my chapters eight and nine did actually meet. Constantine Simonides came to see Madden in February 1853. This strange looking Greek explained that he'd formerly lived among the monks of Mount Athos and that he'd inquired there a number of wondrous manuscripts which he now wished to dispose of. At first I was quite puzzled by their appearance Madden wrote in his journal, never having seen anything like them. During the course of that decade, Simonides suddenly reappeared elsewhere in the Bodleian Library in Oxford that year too, and in Liverpool and Cambridge, but also in Paris, Istanbul, Berlin, Leipzig, Vienna and Athens. Wherever he went, he seemed to have in his possession whatever Greek manuscripts his hosts most wanted to see, usually texts lost since antiquity. Simonides came here, as I have too, to Middle Hill near Broadway in Worcestershire to see Sir Thomas Phillips, the most obsessive manuscript collector of them all and without question an honorary patron of the Manuscripts Club. Madden knew him well and was forever both exhilarated and utterly exasperated by the man. For Phillips, who'd read classics in Oxford, Simonides conjured up a parchment roll of Homer in Greek said to be contemporary with the author and, as he suggested, from the fabled library in Alexandria. Phillips was completely beguiled by it. Madden noted in his journal, of course, although I didn't express it to him, I feel the profoundest contempt for his opinion. Simonides subsequently turned up in Paris, where he supplied a manuscript of the lost works of Demetrius of Magnesia, to the classicist, the Comte de Marcellus, the man who'd brought the Venus de Milo to France, and then in Leipzig, where he brought out a unique manuscript of the Chronicle of Uranius of Alexandria for the historian Karl Wilhelm Dindorf, who immediately edited its new text for Oxford University Press, a bit of an embarrassment as it subsequently turned out. A year or so later, Simonides was in Liverpool, visiting the private Egyptian museum of the industrialist Joseph Mayer. They first met in the building shown here in February 1860. Mr. Mayer had purchased a number of Egyptian papyrus scrolls so tightly rolled that no one had been able to open them. But Simonides said that he could. For a suitable fee, he installed himself in the museum and began peeling them open. The most sensational manuscripts began to emerge. One of these was an account of an extraordinary sea voyage suitable for Liverpool in the 5th or 6th century BC from Carthage down the west coast of Africa, including a description of gorillas, not found again until 1836. Even more astonishing was this, revealed in April 1860. It's a gospel of St. Matthew with an inscription saying that it was made by the scribe Nicholas the deacon in the 15th year after the ascension of Jesus, which is about 48 AD, hundreds of years earlier than any other witness to the gospels. Other biblical texts appeared. They caused a sensation. Churches across Victorian England rang their bells and evangelicals preached on this miracle of the current age. It was the subject of a big book in 1861. Bit by bit, it was eventually realised that every one of these manuscripts had something odd about it. The Homer, Demetrius, Uranius, the sea voyage from Carthage and all the biblical papyri. An inquiry was called by the Royal Society of Literature in 1863, concluding that every one of these manuscripts was a modern forgery. Even now, with all the scientific resources at our disposal, we don't quite know how Simonides did it. Notice the date for the supposed finding of the Gospel of St. Matthew, early 1860 a few months 
after Darwin had published his Origin of Species, the text which seemed to explode the veracity of the Bible. The drawing rooms of Europe were suddenly in uproar that year, divided between those who felt licensed to dismiss the scriptures as fables and those who were desperate for early proof of authenticity. In 1859, that same crucial year, the German scholar von Tischendorf announced his discovery of the principal portion of the 4th century Codex Sinaiticus removed from St. Catherine's Monastery on the Sinai Peninsula and transferred to the Tsar of Russia. It is the oldest, more or less, complete manuscript of the text of the Greek Bible. Von Tischendorf immediately became the hero of all Christians, thrilled to find early proof of uncontaminated scriptures to the extreme jealousy of Simonides whose response must therefore to have been to conjure up in Liverpool in 1860 a papyrus that was 200 years older still and to bask in the glory himself. When he was finally denounced as a forger, Simonides countered with an extraordinary claim. He agreed quite mildly that he was indeed a forger. And he asserted that he himself had also written the Codex Sinaiticus. For the record, he didn't, although some conspiracy theorists still believe him, mostly, I'm afraid, Americans. However, Simonides said he could prove it because he'd signed it in various places and he, he supplied a list of pages and line numbers. When the original was anxiously checked, every one of these pages was found to be mysteriously damaged at just that point. He said von Tischendorf had mutilated it on purpose. Madden's journal for October 1857 recorded the death of Simonides in Alexandria from leprosy, exclamation mark in the journal, a fitting biblical end. And it was reported in many newspapers. However, this was to misjudge the master conjurer, whose magical illusions were not yet over. For later that dec decade, Simonides was seen by the, a British clergyman in St. Petersburg. And in the 1880s, he reappeared very much alive in Vienna, offering to sell a manuscript on the Crusades to the Austrian Academy of Sciences. His death was reported for a second time in Albania in October 1890, and perhaps not, but not necessarily, this time it may have been true. As for the Codex Sinaiticus, it was eventually bought from Russia by the British Museum in 1933 for £100,000 pounds and was carried up the front steps of the museum to the accompaniment of a brass band. Here it is being received by Sir Frederick Kenyon, director of the museum in the centre. It's now probably the greatest single treasure of the British Library and believe me, it is absolutely genuine. On which subject, let's touch finally and briefly on Belle de Costa Green, who found and bought the de Costa Book of Hours with which we began. She'd been working as an assistant in Princeton University Library when in 1905 she came for interview in New York to be personal librarian and assistant to J. Pierpont Morgan, the richest man in America. She explained that she was 23 years old that her aristocratic da Costa was the surname of her Portuguese grandmother, that her mother was a widow born Genevieve Van Fleet from an old family in Virginia, fallen on hard times since the death of her husband. That sentence contains at least six deliberate lies, probably more. It transpires she was actually 27, that's not so important, for she wasn't the first woman in history or the last to be inventive about her age, like Doris Day and Anne Boleyn. More importantly, the Portuguese connection was completely untrue, as was the Van Fleet. She was actually of African-American descent. Both her parents were grandchildren of slaves, and her father was very much still alive. 
His name was Richard Greener, not Green, and he was the first black graduate of Harvard. He'd left his wife and run off with a Japanese woman in Vladivostok on the eastern coast of Russia. He returned to America in 1906, and on landing in San Francisco, he lost everything he owned in the earthquake. If you put this in a novel, no one would call it believable. In pretending to be Portuguese, and therefore a rather dark-complexioned European, Belgreen fabricated an entire but false identity for herself. This is an extraordinarily brave and dangerous thing to have attempted in American high society during the intolerant years of segregation, which allowed no margin of tolerance. And it remained an unsuspected secret about Belle Green until some 50 years after her death. Through force of personality alone, the newly named Belle de Costa Green became the most influential member of our manuscripts club in all of America. Through intimacy in the Morgan household and with a Portuguese-Dutch persona, she was swept into the social circle of the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies and into the opera boxes and parties of the Gilded Age. She completely organized the new Morgan Library in New York, adjacent to Pierpont Morgan's own house in East 36th Street, on the left here. And she turned her employer's untutored acquisitions into a passion for medieval manuscripts. In the end, she worked for both Pierpont Morgans and his son, father and son, and in 1924 became the first director of the Morgan Library when it opened to the public. In addition to the de Costa hours, she secured for the collection many manuscripts which the British Library would have liked, including this 13th century Psalter, which Madden first inspected in 1829 and declared the most beautiful book of the period he'd ever seen. Bell Green later employed Eric Miller of the British Museum to supervise its rebinding. And this 12th century illustrated life of St Edmund of East Anglia, which Madden had tried and failed to buy for the nation in 1841. And this 10th century manuscript of Beatus, which Madden thought he actually had bought in 1855, and which forms not only a chapter, but also the front cover of my previous book on meeting manuscripts. Not surprisingly, such high-profile acquisitions caught the attention of the press, both in America and Europe. Miss Bell Green can spend more money in an afternoon, wrote the New York Times in 1912, than any other young woman in New York City. She was famous for her, for her clothes, sometimes lack of them, People noticed that she was quite dark, but somehow it never crossed anyone's mind that she was anything but Portuguese. She is chic, vivacious and interesting, said the Chicago Tribune. In fact, a dandy, wholesome American girl. In 1909, Belle Green began her passionate love affair with Bernard Berenson, art historian and advisor to millionaires on the paintings of the Italian Renaissance. She almost certainly became pregnant, and there seems to have been a discreet termination when she was booked into Claridge's Hotel in London. Through Berenson, she met the librarian of the Vatican, Father Achille Ratti, with whom she subsequently maintained a spirited, even flirtatious correspondence. Look at the eyes of the man on the left, who seems just to have noticed Belle Green. In 1922, Cardinal Ratti, as he was, was elected as Pius XI, and Belle Green found herself on first-name terms with the Pope. The premise of the new book, as I said at the outset, is that no matter who you are or what your background of wealth or status, a passion for manuscripts crosses all boundaries and brings us into absolute fellowship as equals. Belle Green is perhaps the most striking example from a modest family in Washington who, through a love of manuscripts, ended up on intimacy with half the princes of Europe. Contributors to a volume published to commemorate her death in 1950 included a duke, three knights, an earl, and another cardinal. The club is still open for membership. There's no subscription. There are no qualifications for entry except a delight in illuminated manuscripts. Everyone is welcome. Here we see the saint, the duke, the bookseller, the illuminator, the antiquary, the rabbi, the savant, the librarian, the forger. 
the editor, the connoisseur, and the customer. These are my friends. I hope you can join us. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. That was an incredible talk. And in a moment, you'll have a chance to ask questions. But first, a very brief and very boring announcement. The cloakroom is about to close. So if anyone has left anything in there, please, could you pick it up now? <laughs> and that is all I have to say. And please do if, think of a question, and Christopher will be happy to answer it. Thank you. If there are any questions, I will attempt to answer them. wonderful talk. I was wondering, have you been to St. Catherine's Monastery and is there any, has there been an attempt to catalogue what might be there? Um, the question, no, no, first of all, I'm going to, going to tell you, it began with a, st a statement, we said it was a wonderful talk. The question was then, have I been to St. Catherine's Monastery and is, has there been an attempt to catalogue the manuscripts there? No, I have not been to St. Catherine's Monastery. I'm actually at this very moment, in the last two days, I've been in uh, intensive discussions with the uh, uh, St. Catherine's Foundation about a visit this year, and I hope to go uh, to St. Catherine's this year. I have never been there. Some of you may have done. Um, it used to be extremely inaccessible, and you had to be pulled up in a basket over the wall. Um, it's now actually quite easy to get into it with an appointment, and yes, the manuscripts are now uh, I, well, I hope the manuscripts are now fully catalogued. Um, every so often they do make little discoveries. They did find a few further leaves of the Codex Sinaiticus about 25 years ago um, in some little back room. Um, but the collections are largely intact and it is the oldest surviving library in the world, founded in the 6th century by Justinian um, and still there and still occupied by monks. It's the most I think one of the most romantic sites. Um, Simonides claimed to have been there, when, claimed to have, have, have been there to, to forge the manuscript. Um, uh, but when they checked um, the records of those, the names of those who'd been there, because it was hard to get in in the 19th century, his name wasn't there. He said he travelled under an assumed name. They asked what the name was, he said he couldn't remember. Um, and <laughs> round and round it went. But of course, he, he is Mount Athos. I mean, Mount Athos is where he claims, claims to have come from. So there were th these, these, these two great monasteries, uh, St. Catherine's and Mount Athos. And the Codex Sinaiticus is, 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 is on view through that. Absolutely real. Um. I have a question from an online viewer. This is from Lewis Wang. Uh, Dr. De Hamel, I know you're, that in your book, Meetings with Remarkable Manuscripts, you mentioned being only somewhat impressed on seeing the Book of Kells in person. Um, given that the only person I know who has been granted such a privilege was US President Ulysses Grant, did you feel any kind of awe at being in presence of this great monument of a culture, a modern Ark of the Covenant, so to speak? Um. The question refers to a previous book which does describe a visit to see the Book of Kells, um, the greatest manuscript of the late 8th or early 9th century and uh, almost the only manuscript in the world which is really a national monument. Um, um, it's sort of like Lindisfarne, only it has a better publicist um, and, um, and is later than Lindisfarne. Um, the question is really, did I feel any sense of awe uh, in looking at the original manuscript? Absolutely, yes. Um, I love that. There is that extraordinary sense, which I'm sure we all feel, of being in the presence of a great, great object. Um, it's why... It's why we have cultural artefacts. We all know what the Mona Lisa looks like. We all know what uh, uh, you know, the, the, the pyramids look like or, or, or the, uh, the Hagia Sophia. But actually to stand there and realize that you are literally face to face with one of these great, great cultural objects is a tremendously moving experience. And the, really one of the greatest, well, the greatest Irish manuscript um, to find yourself sitting absolutely you know, two inches from your nose. Yes, it's absolutely wonderful, wonderful feeling. Um, and I love it. 
Um, um, but, but all manuscripts, every manuscript is different from every other manuscript. Every, like people, each one has its own story, its own adventures, its own text, its own, its, its, its own history. I love the great ones, but I also love the little humble ones too, and every, every one is fascinating. Um, I, I sometimes thought one could have done another book on, you know, on, on meetings with really unremarkable manuscripts, and it would be just, it would be just as fascinating. Uh, scruffy little, little things that weren't meant to have survived. Um, there's a thrill about that. But yes, Book of Kells is one of the great, great, great objects, without, without question. Um, have you met any modern private anonymous collectors of manuscripts who you think might be future uh, members of your manuscripts club? I'm talking about just people, I mean, I, I imagine that in that world maybe there's people who are, you know, you never hear about them, but they've got these collections. Um, the question is really about private collectors of manuscripts. Um, yes, of course, there are plenty, there, there are many private collectors of manuscripts. Um, I should just begin by saying that I worked for 25 years full-time and another 19 years as a consultant to Sotheby's, um, and we were supplying manuscripts, I mean hundreds a year, to private collections. There are indeed private collectors, and um, you know, you said, had I ever heard of them? Well, I, I hope I've met them all. Um, and um, uh, 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 I think it's, it's quite interesting to remember, we tend to think of all manuscripts as being public commodities, things that you know, have a shelf mark, an additional manuscript number, or whatever it is, in somewhere like the British Library or the Bodleian or Bibliothèque Nationale, that they've been there forever. Um, that uh, most, many, many manuscripts were made for private owners, all books of ours were, for example, and many of those 15th century, uh, 14th and 15th century secular texts were not made for monasteries, they were privately owned. Then in the 1530s, all the monasteries of, 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 of England were closed and hundreds of thousands of manuscripts were scattered and thrown immediately onto the market. And private collectors began picking them up, including Robert Cotton, but many others who were not Robert Cotton, and many of those books, some of those books still exist in private hands. And at Sotheby's, we would get about two a year, people would walk in with an English, an unrecorded English monastic manuscript, which has been out of captivity since the 1530s. Extraordinary. You know, we think of the Reformation as, as, as so long ago and everything scattered and then uh, are brought in into libraries. It's not that movement of manuscripts caused by the, uh, the Reformation is not yet over. There are still, they're, they're still English monastic manuscripts out there. So, so the answer is yes. Um, are there great mysterious secret collectors? I don't believe it. There are people who are reluctant to show their manuscripts, but I don't believe in that sort of, um, you know, James Bond villain, you know, with a, with, a, with a locked vault. I think that's unlikely. I think, in my experience, most private collectors are thrilled when people want to see what they've got. They're proud of them. Um, they feel their taste is being vindicated. I think most of them are terribly helpful. Um, but it is extraordinary looking at... Madden, only 150 years ago, all those manuscripts in private hands. And there are not so many left today. I mean, it does have, I mean, the, the, they're out there. But he has them every day, people come in with boxes of them. That, I bet that doesn't happen now. Um, Ellie could tell us how often somebody, how recently somebody walked in off the street here with a manuscript to sell. I bet not very often. Um, but then, every day it happened. So, so they are. They are mostly, gradually, gradually getting rarer and rarer in private hands. Some of you may own a manuscript or two. I mean, why not? Um, people do. Um. Uh, Simonides' great genius as a, as a forger was surely that he offered collectors what they had always dreamed of finding and thought they would never see. And, of course, he made them. As he was so prolific, is there a danger that some of Simonides' forgeries are still in collections and thought to be real? Um, the question is really whether any of Simonides' forgeries could still be out there and have fooled people even until now. Um, it is possible. Yes, it is possible. Uh, Madden did actually buy one or two manuscripts from Simonides and got into awful trouble in the press later. He always absolutely insisted that the ones he bought were genuine, and they were, um, but they're here in the library. Um, 
I expect some conspiracy theorist will come up with an idea that these are the, you know, these are fake. Um, I actually started on Simonides by receiving a, 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 an unsolicited e email from um, an American. I, I don't know why it should be an American, but it was. Um, saying, could I help him prove that the Codex Sinaiticus was a fake? And I wrote back and said, it isn't a fake. And I said, all this nonsense about whatever. I said, it belongs with all that, 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 that ridiculous stuff, such as that the moon landings were, you know, were, were staged. And he replied saying they were. Um, <laughs> so, um, but um, yes, it is, it is possible that Simonides sold a manuscript. Oddly, he doesn't really, he doesn't seem to have sold manuscripts terribly often. He produced them. Um, the, um, um, uh, the, 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 the historical text on the King, Kings of Egypt by Uranius, which was edited for the Oxford University Press, the original manuscript has disappeared. No one knows, well, one of you may own it. Um, <laughs> when he died, or when, he thought it, when it was thought he died, Madden wrote in his diary saying, I wonder what happened to that manuscript, but it could be out there somewhere. Um, it could still exist. Somebody might think it's genuine. Um, and occasionally, the odd ridiculous patent forgery turns up, such as that ridiculous one about 10 years ago of a papyrus claiming to be about Jesus' wife. Uh, absolute obvious forgery. Um, and um, I've held it in my hands, and it really, really isn't old. Um, and people said, oh, perhaps that's by Simonides. It isn't. It's not even good enough to be by S Simonides. <laughs> Simonides is actually quite good. And what is so interesting is that because he was writing Greek, many English, many Europeans, I mean, of the people of that period, they knew Greek, but they didn't know it as well as they knew the Latin alphabet. So us looking at a forged Latin manuscript, we now, most of us, would say there's something odd about that writing people didn't know Greek script well enough to pick up that oddity. So he may have got away with it by the fact that everything he was doing was in Greek. Um, but it could be that there were some out there. And but why not? Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering why do you think that we continue to pursue manuscripts and why are, is our interest ever growing, especially as they were originally made to be tools of reflection of faith, but even as we become a more secular society, they continue to be revered and loved. The question is really, why do manuscripts matter at all? I suppose is really what it boils down to. Um, why, why are manuscripts so fashionable and so interesting and so extraordinarily important to us now in our secular age? I think it's worth saying that uh, 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 by no means all manuscripts are, are religious. I mean, uh, many of them are, and you cannot study the Middle Ages without um, uh, an understanding of the position of religion uh, in, um, in society. You couldn't look at the history of architecture without knowing about cathedrals and churches. Of course you couldn't. But uh, not all manuscripts are religious. There's, of course, history, medicine, science, philosophy, travel, um, you know, mathematics, all classical texts um, from Homer right through to, 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 to the fall of the Roman Empire survive through the medium of manuscripts. Um, and those, of course, are pre-Christian or non-Christian. Um, by no means everything is religious. Um, why are they fascinating? Well, they're often very beautiful. They are wonderfully, they have a kind of human scale about them. The word manuscript means written by hand. There's a kind of um, tactile feeling of the sort of human connection of, of, of the hands. Um, they're writing, you can read them, they can talk. They, they can talk to us in words. You can turn the pages of them and they're often in very, very good condition because they've been shut for for. 500 or 1,000 years, and you can really only study medieval art by looking at manuscripts. All the tapestries and frescoes have faded or gone, but manuscripts are still in there. You know, the colours there, absolutely as they would have been when, when Simon Benning finished it. Um, there is, um, um, there's a, um, uh, many of the great artists of the Middle Ages worked on manuscripts, including uh, um, uh, uh, Perugino. There's a signed Perugino manuscript in the British Library, which Madden tried to buy, failed to buy, got really cross, and then was given to the museum 
after his uh, death uh, by Yates Thompson, so it came in anyway. Um, but the romances by Perugino, Raphael, uh, Hol Holbein, uh, uh, um, Giovanni de Paolo, and so on. I mean, great, great panel painters also did manuscripts. Um, they are a medium of literature. Uh, everything we know about all literature for the first 1,500 years of civilization comes through, comes through manuscripts, everything from Homer to, 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 to Chaucer uh, and beyond. Um, they are the window of the Middle Ages. They are the most utterly beguiling of objects, and I defy any of you to walk around the exhibition through there and come away thinking anything different. Thank you. I have another online question, uh, which is kind of a nice branching one from the last, uh, your last answer is, given your obvious passion, <laughs> um, which manuscript would you most like to own yourself? Oh. The question is, which manuscript would I most like to own? This is one of those questions like, who would you most like to have had, a, you know, at a famous, you know, for a, a dinner party, you know, and people always choose somebody like a footballer or something. Well, come on, I mean, you, if you allowed anyone, I mean, you could have Jesus or Aristotle or whatever. Um, the trouble with owning, a, I mean, there are many manuscripts. I'd, I'd love to own the Winchester Bible. I had one of the most fantastic objects, marvellous manuscript. But the problem with actually owning it would be the responsibility of owning it. Um, it is enormously valuable. And if I, you know, if I kept it at home, I'd be frightened to, to leave the house at any moment. Um, and, um, and I would probably end up to le leaving it on deposit in somewhere like the British Library, which is maybe why the question was asked. But um, there are, well, while on the subject of the, the Winchester Bible, sometime in the 19th century and possibly afterwards, a number of its initials were cut out. Madden says this is evidence that the cathedrals shouldn't be allowed to keep things because look how irresponsible they are you know, and, and, and illuminations are missing. And about um, uh, uh, nearly a dozen of its 12th century illuminations are cut out and lost. One was found in the 1940s, was bought back by the National Art Collection Fund and sewn back into the book. All the others are still missing. I would love to find one. I think that's what I'd like more than it. I mean, how about that, says my aunt? I'd love to own a missing initial of the Winchester Bible. It would be immensely valuable. Uh, my children wouldn't have to work again but the, um, it, when they sold it. But I, I, would I think I could keep that at home. It would give me huge pleasure. Um, Thank you very much. It's been a fantastic talk. And I was just thinking about looking at the front cover of your book. Are you involved at all in your long and varied life that you've had with manuscripts in modern manuscripts? I mean, obviously, we're all talking about medieval manuscripts. But are people making manuscripts for the same reason that you love them as this window on the story and a window on life? Are you involved at all in people making manuscripts now? One of the greatest modern illuminators is sitting in the front row here. And um, I'm going to her course on manuscript illumination in, 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 um, in April. Um, I'm fascinated by um, the way scribe... Uh, you might think that the making of manuscript is a kind of dead craft. Um, it absolutely isn't. Uh, you might think the same of thatching. You know, many people thatch houses. I, um, went to see someone once in a castle who was having a new drawbridge put in. And I said, where do you, who builds drawbridges? Now, she said, well, there is a firm that does drawbridges. I mean, that's what, that's what they do. Um, um, there are large numbers of um, um, people who make manuscripts for the pleasure of it. And, and, and I think we medievalists really can learn a huge amount. Um, from things like the cutting of quills, mixing of pigments, uh, 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 mixing of iron gall ink, which, which they used. Um, one of the greatest, most famous modern manuscripts is the Bible uh, made for St. John's Abbey in Minnesota by uh, uh, a scribe, English scribe, uh, or mostly by an English scribe, uh, who lives in Wales. Um, and I was quite involved in that at different stages. I was there when it was commissioned, um, and I've watched him 
I mean, I've sat beside him as, 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 as uh, he's worked on it. Um, yes, I find it totally fascinating. Um, I think it's rather like, um, you I don't think you could really be a historian of, say, music without understanding something about how a violin is played or how a, how a trumpet or whatever your, your musical uh, thing is, or to be um, a, 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 a fanatic on sport without ever having played cricket or football, having some sense of what is easy and what's difficult and what is clever to do and what is not. And I actually find sitting at the feet of a modern scribe, and I'm not good at it, uh, teaches me a huge amount. Yeah, it's, I, I recommend it to all of you. And, and you can still buy, you can still buy quill pens in London. Um, you, can you can still buy uh, 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 lapis lazuli. Um, you know, these medieval pigments, you can still buy parchment, it's still made. Um, manuscripts are not, they haven't died out completely. Uh, the invention of printing knocked them back a bit, but they've never, they have never stopped. Manuscripts are still being made. <laughs>